Hello, so we are at Stansted Airport with the Fly-by-Wire A320 and Microsoft Flight Simulator. If you've not seen this aircraft before, if you've just started out with the simulator, it's actually a free study level A320, Airbus A320. So you can download it from flybywiresim.com on the internet and it gives you a new version of the A320 in the game that is much more accurate to the real aircraft so the avionics and all the systems and the flight modeling is much more like a real aircraft it's still not as high fidelity as a payware aircraft such as the phoenix but it's it's pretty good you know it's good enough for most people so if you have a look around you'll notice immediately there is a tablet in this aircraft that there is not in the out of the box a320 so in order to configure this aircraft i'm going to go around the cockpit doing things and I'm going to be following a paper checklist that I've written up. Now if you've seen any, any of my other videos you'll know that I've written up other checklists for other aircraft. It had never occurred to me I'd never written one for the A320 so or not for the fly-by-wire version so I've corrected that. So I will be putting a link in the video notes so this is kind of the first run through let's see how good my written notes really are. So what do we do in the Airbus? So you can see I am going to be using the right mouse button to pan around quite a lot. It's an easy way of looking around the cockpit. I'm also going to be using key combinations, which I will tell you as we go. So if we press Control and 8 on the keyboard, we immediately go to the overhead panel. The first thing we need to do in the Airbus to power it up is turn on the batteries. Now, you will notice there is a convention in the Airbus family of aircraft that off is good, or dark is good. So, when we turn the first battery switch on, it stays dark because it's on. Yeah, then the second battery switch is illuminated, and we hit it and it goes dark, meaning they're both on, which is a good state for them to be in. Okay, you'll hear some sounds in the cockpit. That's the, the system's basically telling you there's been a change in power source, which is fine. And you can see the batteries are slowly depleting. If you have external power available, you can use it. So we have, so we will engage external power. Okay. The first thing we will do, because we are inside the aircraft, and, and again, this is me looking at the controls, is to go and turn the strobes to auto and turn the nav and logo to two okay so let's just actually change the time of day so it's not quite so dim in the cockpit it's a bit oh i don't think we're going to get much option are we let's go earlier in the year there we go it's a bit brighter for you to see the switches now so in the fly-by-wire airbus there is no intermediate position for the nav and logo light so that's fine so apu the auxiliary power unit is a small jet engine in the tail of the aircraft that provides electricity and compressed air. So if we turn on the master switch for it and then hit the start button for it, if we go and look outside the back of the aircraft, you will see as soon as it starts to fire up, hot air will start pouring out of the back. You can hear it and here comes the hot air. So as soon as it's ready, the start switch will, or the start button will light up with avail for available, basically, saying we have compressed air and we have electrical power available from the APU. As soon as we have the APU, we could actually come off of external power. It's just I'm showing you various switches and what they do around the place. Okay, so next thing we do is turn the crew air supply on, which is done. And then on the sign section at the bottom right, we go and arm the emergency lights. And then we set the no smoking sign to auto. So that will light up above everybody's seats around the cockpit. So there we go. You heard the bong again as it changed power sources. And we've now got the APU power is available to us if, should we wish to use it. Okay, next thing we do is go and configure the ADIAS system. This is the, um, the oh, what's the word? It's a gyro-powered system, inertial navigation system, that's the term. That, so the aircraft knows where it is in space. So over time it measures accelerations on the airframe. So it has a good idea of where it is without needing GPS even. You know, and which way up it is. So it's measuring accelerations, but to do that it uses gyros. Notice all of these switches are on by default. 
So we've just turned them all to nav, or each, there's three systems. Turn them each of them to nav, and it takes a while to spin up, okay? Or to calibrate itself, I should say. You can influence it. If we go and boot up the tablet in the aircraft, the tablet has all of the controls, both for meddling with flight plans, should you use something like Simbrief, and for configuring how the aircraft works. So if we click on the cog at the bottom left and go into realism, there's an ADIAS align time, so that's that inertial navigation system. I've got it set to instant. If you have it on real, it can take seven or eight minutes for it to align. And until it has aligned, these screens won't have anything meaningful on them. Because the attitude indicator is dependent on the aeroplane knowing which way up it is. And the navigation display, the, you know, the, the um, lateral location of the aircraft is dependent on the... Um, ADIA system as well. So until it's aligned and online, those won't have anything meaningful on them. Obviously I set it to instant, so it's immediately working, which saves us seven or eight minutes down the road. Like, having said that, it would have probably taken us that long to talk through doing things, so we're not going to get too hung up on it. Okay, we're going to go and configure brightnesses of things around the cockpit. So on the left hand side, on the pilot side, you've got the PFD knob here, which is this screen. You've got the ND navigation display, which is the inner knob here. And then on the co-pilot side, same again. You've got the ND knob and the PFD, primary flight display. In the centre for the engineering displays or the ECAM screens, you've got the upper display brightness and the lower display brightness, which are down here on the pedestal. And then for the master control panel for the autopilot, you've got uh, the left hand knob does the illumination of the tracks behind the instruments and the right hand knob does the illumination of the the displays okay so we've brightened everything up a bit so it's easy to see oh finally down here we've got the mcdu the uh, the flight computer there's a bright and dim rocker switch so we can click brightness a few times and it will go bright okay so now we're going to go and program our flight. So to centre this up on the screen, we can press Control and 5. And we're going to go to the FMGC page. And that pulls up this status page telling us about the database we're using, and it's all good. And it says GPS primary, that's just telling us, you know, which system it's using. So we can clear that message out. So the bottom line of the MCDU is always the, um, can be used for messages or status or for us to input things, we can key into it, look, we can press keys yeah, and we can clear to delete what we've typed okay, if you want to copy something that's already written somewhere, you just click on it and it writes it into the scratchpad for you doesn't mean you're going to do anything with it anyway, so the first page we go to is the init page so we're going to initialize our flight so we put in where we're going from and to, so we need the code letters of the airfields. I know them off the top of my head for this flight because I've done it lots of times for tutorials. EGSS is the ICAO code for Stansted. Then we need a slash. And then EGPH would be the, the ICAO code for Edinburgh. Okay, so it, then it pops up this intermediate page. We just return and it comes back and that's key, that's keyed in for us. Next thing we need is a cost index. The cost index relates to a formula which governs how aggressively the aircraft can accelerate or climb. So it's how, how quickly you're going to burn your fuel basically. Um, typically it can go anywhere from zero up into the hundreds but we're, go we're going to put in 100 as our cost index. Next one is the cruise flight level. So this is how high you're going to be flying in the sky. So it's thousands of feet divided by 100, basically. So it's, it, we're actually writing in hundreds of feet. So 36,000 would be 360. You can type it as thousands, and it will understand. So we could have written 36,000, but we can also put 360, and it understands exactly what that means. So it prefixes it with FL for flight level. Okay, if we have a look in IRS initialization, you can see it's got all the data. Obviously, that would be different if we hadn't got instant align. It would probably say aligning. If we look in wind temp, we can actually go and request the wind. You can only do that if you're using Simbrief. So when we were, if we had used the tablet and fetched the plan from Simbrief, then we could have um, pulled the wind in as well. 
There's another way of doing that. I'll just briefly touch on this. If we go to the MCDU menu, which is where we started, you'll see there's ATSU. And inside ATSU, there's AOC. If you go into AOC, you can do an init. And you essentially, you're fetching the flight plan from Simbrief. But we're not going to get into that today. OK, so we did the init. OK, we filled in the basics on there. Notice there's a, a double arrow at the top corner. If we go right, there's more on the initialization. So it wants the zero fuel weight. It will auto calculate it. If we just click the button next to it, it knows the weight of the airframe. So then we can just click that and it filled it in. So it's also said there's a zero fuel weight center of gravity. So when the aircraft was empty, it weighed 42.5 tons and the center of gravity was 25% basically. Um, so now it wants to block fuel. If we scroll up, you will notice at the bottom left of the primary or the upper ECAM screen, it's got the block fuel written there. So at this point, it's presuming we've already filled the aircraft up with fuel. I'm not going to get into how you fuel it up today, but you can just go and put in 3.8 tons into the MCDU. So 3.8. So we keyed that into the scratch pad and put that into the MCDU and the numbers get calculated and it works all sorts of things out for us. Okay, so then we can go back. So there's the initialization is now essentially done. The next thing we'll do is go and put the basics of the flight plan in. So if we go and click on the flight plan page, all it knows so far is we're going from Stansted to Edinburgh. It doesn't know how we are going to leave Stansted or how we're going to arrive at Edinburgh. So if we go and have a quick look at Navigraph, we can see, if I pull up this on the chart, so there is the standard instrument departure we are going to use to leave Stansted. So we'll leave on runway 22. So we can see that on the chart here. Runway 22 is this one. And we're going to follow this standard approach, sorry, standard instrument departure. Yeah, which is the BKY-5R standard instrument departure. So let's go into the aircraft. If we click on Stansted, notice it comes up automatically knowing that this is where we're leaving from. So it says departure. So we click on departure and we can choose runway 22. And there's a list of the standard instrument departures. If you can't see what you're after, if it's not fitting on the screen, you can you can push the list up and down using the arrow keys. We want the BKY5R departure. So we've chosen the ILS, sorry, the runway and the um, BKY5R. So we can insert that straight into our flight plan. So now all of these waypoints along that route are programmed into our flight plan. Okay, if we press the arrow keys, we can scroll through by pushing the contents of the screen up and down. Okay, so you'll notice we get there's our standard instrument departure as far as this waypoint, and then there's a huge discontinuity that a gap, and then there's Edinburgh. So, how are we going to arrive at Edinburgh? Let's go and click on it and let's go and have a look at the chart for how we're going to come into Edinburgh. So we're going to come in on this AGP E1E standard approach route. So if we zoom out a little bit, there's our approach route. And then we're going to go ILS into runway 24. OK, so we'll go click on arrival. So we choose the ILS for 24 and AGP E1E. There it is. So we select that. So we've selected the approach and the star, the standard approach route, and we insert that into our flight plan. and return. Has it actually done it? Let's go and double that looked a bit strange to me. Yes it has, it's done it. Okay so we've got this big discontinuity in the middle of the flight plan, yes? So we're taking off from Stansted, we're flying along and then we get to a discontinuity. So what are we going to do with that discontinuity? We get to T-A-R-T-N. So what we can do is just clear that out. So we press clear and delete it. So it's basically saying go from the end of that approach and then go straight onto the ILS. 
So if we scroll down a little bit here as well, you'll notice there's the end of the star, sorry, the end of the SID, the instrument departure, and there's the beginning of the star. What if we wanted to put a waypoint in between the two? So if we go and key in at TNT, which would be the Trent VOR, which is in the middle of the UK, and we put it on top of the beginning of the star, it will push that down. It's asking because there are many TNTs around the world. Notice they are in distance order. The closest one is the one we're after, which is 99 miles away. So we select that one. And you'll notice TNT has appeared now in front of AGPED. Yep. So we've actually inserted it in front of the plan. So if we go and have a look, there's a, a nice trick you can do in the Airbus where if you switch the um, the primary flight display to plan mode, you can then use the up and down keys to step through your flight plan. So you can see, obviously if you want to make more sense of it, you can zoom out as well. He says famous last words, as it takes ages to show enough information. So you can see that as we step, step through, we can have a look at our flight plan bit by bit. Okay, It always shows you, centred on here, the, the second line down on the display. Yeah, just to make it obvious to you what you're seeing here. If you switch this back to arc mode, then obviously it's aircraft oriented once again. And we'll pull the zoom back so we can see the beginning of that st standard instrument departure. Okay, so we've programmed the basics in, which is all good. So now we need to go back to the performance page on there actually. So let's go to performance and we're going to put in the flaps setting we're, we're taking off with. So the important thing is we've told the aircraft actually about the runway we're using. That's the important takeaway from all of that is the aircraft now knows how long the runway is. So we can now put in the flaps. So we're going to go flaps one. We're not going to worry about this. This is trim that you can impart on the aircraft. I'm going to do, I'll do a video at some point about the Airbus about all of this. It gets quite involved because you've got flex temps and things and yeah, a transition altitude. I happen to know we've got an, a transition altitude of 6,000 feet here. It will be on your chart for the departure. So um, we have now got enough information that we can get the aircraft to pre-calculate these numbers for the rotate speeds. So if we click on V1, it comes up with the number in the scratch pad. If we click it again, it fills it in for us. So the aircraft's done all the maths based on how heavy it is and what flap settings we've used to work out how fast we need to go for when we rotate on the runway. Obviously, if you fill wind speeds in, that's going to be different again. So this is based on it having no knowledge of the wind. Okay. And you can then step through and you can review the behavior of the aircraft through climb, cruise, descent, and so on. Yep, and approach. So, for example, while you're en route, you might get the QNH, the barometric pressure of the destination airfield. Okay. So, we have set the route up, which leads us on to the QNH, funnily enough. So, you can either do the QNH manually, where you look it up on a chart on a Metal report, and go and, you know, tune in the QNH and do the, the, um, the backup uh, QNH as well. Or, you just press B on the keyboard and it does it for you, which I've just done. You will notice if you've not seen this before, the QNH, if you've got a, a different reading on your Metal report than inches, so if you've got hectopascals, is tip, typically used in Europe versus inches in the US. So you can switch between the two very easily. Okay, uh, it's worth having a little look at the master control panel here. I press control and two to center this up. So we're gonna configure this up just, you know, for argument's sake for the runway. So you'll notice each of these knobs. If you click the top half of a knob, that's the same as pushing it in. If you click the bottom half of a knob for these primary knobs along here, that's the same as pulling it, okay? The reason for that is the difference in the Airbus between managed mode and selected mode. If you push the knob in, you're pushing it towards the aeroplane. 
so you're essentially saying I want you to do what you think based on what I've told you yeah so that's managed mode where the airplane manages the flight itself if you pull a knob so you click the bottom half in the simulator you can see there managed was a dot against it selected me pulling the knob I'm pulling the knob towards myself meaning I am making the decision so therefore I get to then roll that knob to say, in this case it's for the speed, oh sorry, for the heading. Um, I'm saying I want you to fly this direction. So now I know the runway is 222 degrees. So what I'm doing is I'm just preparing it before I put it back on managed mode anyway. Just in case. For the altitude you might want to say I want to climb out initially to 10,000 feet. The air traffic control might typically tell you what your initial climb is going to be. But then you may also have restrictions based on the flight plan. The aeroplane, if you've got a standard instrument departure programmed in, will follow those restrictions for you. But you can, you know, it's always heading towards the target altitude you've set for your initial climb. Okay, and you could do that either as a, uh, a managed mode climb out, or you can go for vertical speed and do it yourself. Okay, so we're going to leave that as is for the moment the automatic throttle will switch on automatically when we start off down the runway so don't worry about that um, okay so I've looked at the Q&H we've looked at the master control panel so we go overhead and we're pretty much getting ready now to get the airplane up and running so seat belts go to on and on the electrical section in the middle we turn the external power off if we were using it because by now obviously in the real world we would we would have done all this really quickly so the APU would now have been up and we're obviously we're taking 10 times longer because we're talking about things so the APU was up and ready to go already so at this point you get a bit of a dilemma in a simulator because in the real world the pushback which we're about to do would happen in concert with the engine start but there's only one of me yeah so and because the I, I want to show you what's built into the aircraft there are add-ons for the flight simulator that will manage the pushback for you so I'm going to go to the ground icon on the tablet and you'll notice there's a pushback option so I can turn the pushback system on and confirm it I can release my parking brake in the aircraft you can see that's been indicated here and then I can call the tug which happens instantly which isn't realistic in the real world you would have given instructions over the radio to the tug saying please push us back onto taxiway XYZ whatever it is and they get on with it and they would tell you when it's okay to start your engines once they've connected up to the aircraft and then while you're being pushed back you can get on with that I'm gonna have to do one thing after another here so it cause it can't happen at the same time which is a shame so we'll say push us backwards please so we're rolling notice we can actually say we can go a bit faster and we can say if we want to go left or right and it superimposes a line onto the ground which represents the path we are taking okay so we can speed it up a bit further we can drag this around with the mouse we can center it up by clicking on the airplane so we're just being pushed back obviously yeah in the like I say in the real world we could be starting the engines while this is happening but we're not in the real world we're in a simulator with restricted options available to us as I said there are add-ons that will let you do a planned pushback okay so we'll stop that there we'll put the parking brake back on and we'll turn this off okay so this is now disabled so what should we have been doing to start the engines we go back overhead we turn the beacon light to on we turn all of the Flight fuel pumps to on. We turn the APU bleed to on. So this provides the compressed air from the small jet engine in the tail to spin up the engines. Okay, so then we look down here. The reason I'm pulling the view down 
is we are I'm going to use my controller to do this but I'm going to indicate what's going to happen we're going to turn this switch to start and then flick the switches for the engines so start and then engine number two and you will see the N2 percentage the gas turbine is being spun up When it goes through about 20-25% the exhaust gas temperature will suddenly rise as the fuel is injected and ignited. There we go, you can hear it happening. Now if we had not turned the fuel pumps on the N1 would not have accelerated. So if you're sat here wondering why the N1 is not accelerating you've forgotten your fuel pumps. Okay. Now you'll notice down here there are some valve indicators so if we go and throw this the lever for engine number one as well it won't happen straight away or it has happened almost straight away so we are doing both at the same time notice you get some indications here of you know just notifications to keep you aware of what's configured on the aircraft so parking brake is on the ignition system is active TCAS is on standby, that's the traffic collision avoidance system. Normally you wouldn't switch that on until you're off the runway because it's radar essentially and if you hit somebody at close range on the ground with radar they're probably not having children. <laughs> I don't think it's quite that severe with these systems but I'm, I'm sure real ground crew would warn you in no uncertain terms never to be near it. So you can see that it's now saying the predictive wind shear is off. So we come down here and there's a little switch here. So it's got a system in the aircraft to predict for wind shear. Okay, so the engines are coming up to idle. So we can now go and turn off the ignition system. Doesn't have to be on the whole time. And now the engines are running, we can go and turn the APU bleed to off. So APU bleed was up above. So there we go, APU bleed is now off. And we can turn off the APU because the cross feed has happened automatically. Unlike the Boeings, as soon as the engines were generating power, it, um, it cross fed power the power source for the aircraft over to the engines. So the APU is then redundant essentially. Okay, let's carrying on down the, uh, the the list here. Flaps to takeoff position. So I programmed into the APU. I was going to have the flaps at position one. So if we watch the lever here, I move the flap lever to position one, and you can see them travelling on the display here. So that corresponds with the 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 slats, leading edge slats, and the flaps moving into position. They take a while. Okay, we then arm the nose wheel steering. So what this really refers to is the chocks, <laughs> which we obviously don't have. So there are some things that happen automatically around the aircraft. So if you were to go and look, if we were, if we were still connected to the pushback system, which we are not, then the nose wheel steering would be disengaged. So at the moment you disconnect from the pushback, then it's re-engaged automatically. So while you are connected to the, the tractor, it will say that nose wheel steering is disconnected. So that's an indicator that you're still on the tractor. Okay? So obviously I should have pointed that out while we were connected. I didn't think to. Okay. Um, arm the ground spoilers. So we come down here and we pull the spoiler knob upwards and that arms the ground spoilers. We also go and set the auto brakes to max. Okay, nose light goes to taxi. So that's over above our head. So we move the nose light to taxi. And we get ready to take off basically. So we're now ready to taxi. So we can come off the parking brake now. Notice the plane has started rolling. At idle, the A320 has a small amount of positive thrust. So on level ground, it will start rolling with the engines at idle. 
So we're rolling out towards the runway now. Okay, so we'll just zoom out slightly. Okay, so it's actually taking off in the A320 is actually child's play. All of the work is done up front in configuring the aircraft. All we're going to have to do is steer it down the runway with the throttles pushed all the way for all the way forwards, and then rotate. Always oh, is a race to get to the taxiway first. I think we're going to win that one. So then, yes, we rotate, and then we configure the autopilot once we're in the air and it's all on managed mode we just let go at that point and the aeroplane manages its ascent its speed its direction and everything so it's going to be a bit of an eye-opener if you've never seen it do it before so I don't think there's anything coming so we're going to roll onto the runway if there is anything coming tough luck we're not using ATC today so we're not going to sit here for 10 minutes waiting Because we programmed all of the speeds in, we will get call outs along the runway, or hopefully we will. I'm not sure if it does that in the fly by wire actually. We'll find out. Okay, so we'll just straighten up. Something to be aware of in the fly by wire is the nose wheel steering has a lag on it. So if you think about it, there are huge servos that are turning the, the front wheel. It's like a power steering system. So where you might be pushing the pedals around to make the aircraft steer on the ground or using the tiller. Tiller's over here. Um, the aircraft will be lagging behind your instruction. So it's just something to be aware of. Okay, so we go and push the throttles forwards. Gonna push them all the way forwards. I'm doing this on purpose with actually moving the throttles to the full end, full end, the far end of their throw. So we hold the centre line by steering. Coming through our rotate speeds, we've already gone through them. So we rotate. Yeah, there was no calling. So gear up. Pull the throttles back to the CL detent. I'll explain it in a moment. I've moved it so the throttles are back to here. Notice when I let go of the controls, the attitude stayed the same. If it doesn't, your Airbus is not accurate. So I'm now going to press autopilot. We're over speeding. That's because I held it on the power for too long and it doesn't know how to get back out of it. It's interesting, isn't it? So I'm going to pull the throttles back myself. So I almost did that on purpose, to be honest, just to show you what can happen. There we go. So we'll get rid of the alarm. So, all I'm illustrating there is that the aircraft cannot perform wonders. Yeah, you need to be mindful of what's going on with the aircraft. And it was accelerating at such a rate, it couldn't stop accelerating. I haven't got the auto throttle on, look. That's why it happened. Yeah, so you need to keep an eye on things. When we started accelerating down the runway, the auto throttle wasn't on. So it will not perform wonders for you. You still need to make sure that you're ahead of the aircraft, and that's where practice comes in. I, almost, I wanted it to go wrong there on purpose. Just to illustrate to you, the Airbus, yes, it's wonderful. Yes, it can do all sorts of things. But if you don't tell it to do the wonderful things, it won't do them. So you can see now it's flying the route, basically. So notice what I said earlier. We've set a target of 10,000 feet. It stopped at 4,000 feet. That's because of the standard instrument departure. If we go and have a look at it, There's a 4,000 feet setting until it gets out to D358C. Yeah? So it's not going to go beyond 4,000 feet. 
it's also complaining look the TCAS is still on standby so we come down at this point and we can turn the TCAS to TARA and that goes away oh sorry I haven't turned it on yet I've switched it to TARA and then we turn it on and that warning goes away now it's just warning us about the seat belts so at this point it's up to us when we let the passengers get up usually you would be out of your standard approach a standard instrument departure because you might be you know making all sorts of turns and sudden altitude changes and you don't want people to be staggering around in the aisles so you normally the I I believe the flight crew get most of their work out of the way for the departure before they go and remove the seatbelt sign and let people move around but just to illustrate how we might do that we can come up overhead oh we might go and put the landing lights on as well I've missed that on the checklist it was on my checklist so typically below 10,000 feet commercial traffic has to keep their landing lights on um, you've got your seatbelt sign here so we can switch that off and let the passengers go wander about hear the sudden mayhem as they all run for the toilet okay so we're now en route so that was kind of a, a bit of a walk through explaining lots of things along the way and obviously we had the the near disaster on takeoff we didn't we just oversped a little bit um, but it was a really really kind of um, important point I was making there that you can't just expect an Airbus to fly itself it's going to do exactly what you told it to do yeah so unless you've got everything configured it won't do things for you okay but yeah so it's a much more accurate version of the Airbus than the one that comes with the simulator it's still not quite as accurate as the Phoenix Airbus but then the Phoenix Airbus costs about 40 pounds 45 pounds and this one is free something just to play with on the way out just to show you a bit of an easter egg that's built into the aircraft if we go into the MCDU menu and go to ATSU and AOC and do a weather request it's got the airports for departure and destination already programmed we'll send that request so it's sending the request it's sent if we come back out of there You'll notice there's a received messages here and if you look up here i think it tells you up here if there are any messages waiting i think it will appear on this display let's give it a few moments i don't it may only be in the phoenix it does this i'm not sure so let's go and have a look in received messages nothing yet oh here we go company message yeah it does work so received message if we look in the METAR screen we've now got the readout of the the weather report for the departure airfield and the destination airfield so we can print that out and if you go and look around here there's a little printer in the aircraft and it prints out that weather report we just requested onto thermal paper and then we can click on it to tear it off and it sticks it on the dash for us to look at so I think that's really cool anyway so while we're busy doing that the airplane's flying the route all on its own which is fine okay I'm going to leave it there hopefully that was interesting and I'll speak to you again soon oh you can see actually look because we've got to 10,000 feet the QNH has started to flash that's because we've gone through the transition altitude so what we should have done at 6,000 feet, again, two pilots on the real plane, they've got time to do all this stuff. Uh, pull for standard, there we go, it's standard. So it's gone to STD, so it stops flashing. So the aircraft knew that it shouldn't have been showing us the altitude it was. So then you could go for a climb to our cruise altitude, for example. So we set 36,000 if you push the knob in it's managed mode and the aircraft will climb on of its own accord ok 
okay so from this point it's a waiting game until you're on descent into the destination anyway hopefully that was interesting for you and that's the fly-by-wire airbus see you again soon